In December 1938, Raymond Geist, head of the American Embassy in Berlin, wrote to the U.S. State Department: "The Jews in Germany are being condemned to death, and their sentence is being slowly carried out, but probably too fast for the world to save them." To many of the Jews in Europe, it felt as if the world idly watched their suffering, but there were a few who chose to take a stand. We need to talk," said attorney Gilbert Krauss to his wife Eleanor in their Philadelphia home that day. Gil's friend Louis Levine, Grand Master of the Jewish Brith Shalom organization to which they both belonged, discussed with him the possibility of rescuing 50 Jewish children from Nazi Germany. Brith Shalom had recently built a Jewish children's summer camp, and there was an empty dorm with 25 rooms, perfect for housing the children. No one in his right mind would go to Germany now," Eleanor replied. "It's not safe, especially for Jews, but it felt like the right thing to do. When Germany annexed Austria, life changed dramatically for the Jews. Nazis removed Jewish professionals, took Jewish property, kept customers from Jewish businesses, and forced Jewish children to the back of classrooms. The Jewish people. I mean, I saw them on the street. They wore、uh, David stuff. Just seeing the Star of David, you know that they were not treated properly. My best friend, she was Jewish. Of course, her father he could never really have a job anymore. I never forget the picture of the Jewish father. He looked so frightened. My mom remembers when they were moving. Her neighbor came and took her bike and said, "You're not going to be able to use this where you're going. So you're Jewish, so we might as well have it." Nazis took over our apartment, so somehow my mother found a United States citizen and had an apartment in Vienna, and we all moved in with her. Hermann Göring stated, "The Jew must know we do not care to live with him. He must go." In the last ten days of March 1938, more than 25,000 Viennese Jews applied for emigration visas. Adolf Eichmann established the central office of Jewish emigration in Vienna, where paperwork was filed and taxes amounting to more than half a person's income were paid. This is like an automatic factory, Eichmann boasted. You put at one end a Jew who still has capital. He comes out the other end. He has no money. He has no rights. Only a passport in which it is written, "You must leave this country within two weeks. If you fail to do so, you will go to a concentration camp." Ironically, the process of getting permission to leave made it almost impossible to have the financial independence required by nations like the U.S. to do so. Henny Wenkart said later, "What people don't understand is that in the beginning, you could get out. Everyone could get out, but nobody would let us in." In November, Joseph Goebbels ordered the pogrom known as Kristallnacht. Police were ordered to stand down while mobs burned and vandalized Jewish synagogues and businesses and beat to death 27 Jews in Vienna alone. It was very loud. It was very loud, and since we lived so close to the stores, you know, we could、uh, hear all the noise. I remember my father saying Germany would have to pay bitter for that. And I remember standing. With my dad across the synagogue that was still smoking the next morning, and he was very, very upset. In the main street,、uh, Jewish businesses like Woolworth, the front windows were smashed in. The first thing they did was they started taking apart the synagogue that was a block away from us. My father was frightened. My grandfather also. He was one of the first to be sent to a concentration camp. I remember women at night crying out by the police station after their mates. Thousands were sent to concentration camps. Jews were expelled from schools, banned from public places, and forced into ghettos. By March 1939, less than four percent had a job. Their time was running out. Immigrating to the United States was difficult. Isolationism, unemployment fears, and anti-Semitism kept the numbers low. Every country had a quota they could not exceed. Each immigrant required a sponsor in the U.S. In addition, no immigrant could be in danger of needing public financial assistance. As FDR described his shock over Kristallnacht at a press conference, a reporter asked if immigration policy should change to allow Jewish refugees in the country. FDR answered, "No, we have the quota system." A short time later, a bill seeking to bring 20,000 Jewish refugee children to America failed to gain support. 
Introduced by a friend to Assistant Secretary of State George Messersmith, the Krauses traveled to Washington, D.C. to meet with him on February 3, 1939, and discuss the possibility of the rescue mission. Mrs. Krauss and I are prepared to go to Germany to arrange with governmental authorities the selection and transportation of the children, explained Gill. Brith Shalom would pay for it all. Messersmith listened, then informed them that the quotas had been filled for the next five years. Gill brought up a discrepancy he had discovered. The number of visas issued was always greater than the number actually used. During Hitler's first six years, 106,000 visas went unused. Would it be possible, he asked Mr. Smith, to set aside some of the unused visas for children of families who are already on the waiting list? Mr. Smith was intrigued and promised to write Geist at the embassy in Berlin to gain his opinion. Two weeks later, Geist replied. As word spread about the rescue, Gill was repeatedly approached by leaders in the community, even Jewish leaders, and told to stop. Confused by this reaction, Eleanor, who spent six weeks completing 54 affidavits for the children's sponsors, wrote, Our minds were made up. No one was going to stop us. Joined by pediatrician Robert Schles, they set sail April 7, 1939. When they reached Berlin, Geist explained that time was running out for the Jews in Vienna and urged them to seek the children there. In Vienna, the Krauses had to search through thousands of cards containing information about those seeking to emigrate. They contacted the Jewish organizations in Vienna. My mother was a tough cookie. My mother made sure that I would be involved in it. Gil, Eleanor, and Robert narrowed down the list of potential candidates through questionnaires and interviews. I know we had to take some kind of an intelligence test, and you had to be healthy. In order to get past Nazi officials, every child would need to be physically and emotionally able to handle the journey. The selection process was devastating to Eleanor, as all were in equal need of being rescued, but they could only take 50. Clara Ratner's father expressed the feelings of most when he said, We may die here, but Clara is not going to die. She is going to go and lead a life in America. As final decisions were made on the list of children, officials at the American consulate told the Krauses the affidavits were unacceptable and there were no visas for them in Vienna. Unwilling to give up now, the couple traveled to Berlin where they asked Geist if he could help them obtain visas. He promised to try. Back in Vienna, Gil, Eleanor, and Robert Schles held a meeting with the families whose children had been selected. Five-year-old Heinrich Steinberger became ill and was replaced. Every parent signed custody of their child over to the Krauses. It was as if we had drawn up in a lifeboat in a most turbulent sea, said Eleanor. Each parent seemed to say, here, yes, freely, gladly, take my child to a safer shore. The Krauses and parents were interrogated by the Gestapo before gaining permission to leave. On May 21, 1939, the children boarded the train for Berlin. Their parents stood quietly, but did not wave goodbye. Jews giving the Nazi salute would be arrested. Eleanor described it as the most heartbreaking display of dignity and bravery I have ever witnessed. Their bravery paid off. When the children reached Berlin, Raymond Geist had kept his promise. Fifty visas were theirs. After staying a night in the capital, they easily boarded the SS Harding in Hamburg and set sail for America. So I landed in June. My mother came here in January. Some had to wait longer. Some never saw their parents again. My father was still very nervous about being arrested by the Nazis, so he decided to go to Poland. And in Poland is where they got a hold of him and finished him off. He was shot in a field. Hugo White's mother and little Heinrich Steinberger were killed on the same day at Sobibor. The Krauss mission was the single largest group of unaccompanied children brought to America. The Krauses wanted to bring a second group of children, but World War II began in September, ending those plans. The Krauses saved not only my mom's life, but they saved my life because I wouldn't be here and my kids' lives so they wouldn't be here. Life depended on it. Most children were reunited with their parents who found it easier to obtain a visa when their child was already in the U.S. They began new lives in a new land. At a Brith Shalom meeting that summer, Gil said to the members who had sponsored the rescue, while the number 50 is but a small drop among the hundreds of thousands of lives yet to be saved, Still, in all, each life is worth a world unto itself.
Hashem lo yishmoriyin, shav shav kapsho imer.